Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Thomas Pogge, Director of the Yale Global Justice Program, welcoming you to today's seminar on tax justice, political lobbying, and campaign finance in the United States. The session will be opened and moderated by James Henry, investigative journalist and former chief economist at McKinsey and Company. We will then be hearing from Frank Clemente, the executive director of Americans for Tax Fairness, and also from Bill Bradley, who after a legendary career as a basketball player, popped it off with another legendary career as a US Senator. Over to you, Jim. So let's get going and I will launch into this very brief overview of what we're talking about today. So we've discussed the existence of the global haven industry as a, a, a real problem, uh, shaping a lot of different uh, issues that we're talking about. Uh, the focus today is on uh, tax dodging and especially first world havens, and in particular, uh, the role of the United States. Uh, traditionally, the United States uh, played an important role in progressive taxation around the world uh, in uh, longstanding uh, support for the income tax, for the corporate income tax, dating all the way back to at least to 1913. Uh, but today, uh, we have to describe it as uh, really the world's leading haven, not only for individual investors, but also increasingly for corporations. And that's become a special problem in the last few years under the Trump administration, uh, where we see uh, a radical, sh radical reduction in corporate tax rates. So historically, you know, Wilson signed the first progressive income tax in the US in 1913, um, partly motivated by the war. We were strong advocate of multilateral tax collaboration, tax treaties, tax enforcement. We have the toughest anti-bribery laws in the world and also bank regulation uh, was inordin inordinately stringent in the US. Uh, that unfortunately uh, gave way to a period in which the US is really running hard to keep up with the world effort to try to reform uh, the international tax system. We've seen beginning in 2008, 2009, and I was involved in this uh, tax justice network, uh, real efforts by the OECD uh, and the G20 to reform the international tax system, make sure that corporate taxes in particular were uh, enforced uh, around the globe. And that uh, quickly bogged down into an effort. We've seen some progress on issues like country by country reporting, uh, the, uh, you know, the recent efforts to revive the financial transactions tax and led by the EU. Uh, but the US has been uh, fighting that uh, tremendously in the area. Uh, here's a chart that describes the kind of the, the effort by the US to uh, gather information on investors from overseas that use the US financial system. Uh, the sad thing about this is we gather an awful lot of data under the 2012 FACTA rules. Uh, but we don't really share that with other countries. And one of the pressing uh, issues for the Biden administration will be to what extent we will uh, be able to share uh, all of this information that we gather on international investors from uh, with, uh, with the other countries on a reciprocal basis. Uh, it, the US is uh, really under all administrations has been reluctant to do so. So the first aspect of the US as a haven uh, that we wanna talk about, and I think this sets up some of the issues that Frank will talk about, uh, to what extent Biden can overcome uh, the, these rules, is the traditional role that the United States has played uh, as a kind of haven for wealthy investors who come to the United States as so-called non-resident aliens. Since at least the 1920s, uh, we've had very favorable rules uh, allowing foreigners to have investments here, uh, specifically in bank accounts and capital gains and not pay any taxes on them. And uh, uh, that has been a, a, a serious source of attraction uh, to foreign capital. It really accelerated by the fact that we have 
very little beneficial ownership registration reporting among all the US states that now offer uh, limited liability corporations. We have 13 states that offer ironclad asset protection trusts that are as good as anything you can find in the Cook Islands. And so across the board, we have seen uh, the expansion of the US as a destination uh, for people who want to uh, take their money from other countries and put it here essentially tax-free, as long as they can even live in the United States up to 180 days uh, uh, and uh, not pay any, any taxes at all and be able to, uh, on, their, on their capital investments. Um, in the area of corporate taxation, more recently, the US has really been leading the race to the bottom. Uh, and there's a lot of details to go into here, but just quickly, since the 1980s, we've seen sharp reductions in the marginal corporate tax rates by country. Uh, this is a, a real issue for the Biden administration because what happened under Trump was this got even worse under the uh, December 2017 tax reform uh, that was uh, rushed through the Senate without any debate. Uh, we basically had uh, the top rate reduced. The United States adopted a kind of uh, what's called a territorial tax system, and the headline rate is now 21%. Uh, interesting question is whether the Senate will now be able to reverse that corporate uh, tax rate. Moreover, there's also been a, a reluctance to collaborate with other countries in the OECD on trying to have global tax reforms, such as the one proposed yesterday, just yesterday by Janet Yellen to have a minimum corporate income tax. Uh, under Trump, we saw even crazier things. This is an example. We had roughly $2.6 trillion offshore that US companies had stashed because under existing corporate uh, income tax rules, they weren't taxable until they repatriated their offshore profits. Uh, what Trump did uh, in the 2017 uh, reforms, so-called so reform, was he allowed people to repatriate that money, uh, but uh, uh, all they really had to do was to pay a 15% tax, and they were given eight years to pay the tax. Uh, and uh, in fact, they didn't have to bring it back in order to qualify for the, the tax break. Uh, so a lot of this money has never been taxed. A lot of it is still sitting offshore and under the, the uh, new territorial tax system, the earnings on it won't be taxed at all. So this has been a gigantic uh, loophole, something like an $800 billion gift to large multinationals, especially American firms. This uh, corporate tax rate uh, is really very important, not just to the United States, you know, where the United States is now with a 21% uh, rate down in the area that uh, Latvia and Slovakia uh, are competing at. It's also especially uh, true of uh, developing countries because uh, countries like Nigeria and South Africa, uh, uh, many Latin American countries depend much more heavily on the corporate income tax for their federal tax revenues than the United States does. Here's a chart for all of the OECD countries. And you can see that now the United States uh, recently has only re received about 7% of its revenues from the corporate income tax. Other countries like Germany, uh, are, it's, the figure is even lower. Um, and so uh, one of the key issues here for uh, the impact of the Biden administration reforms uh, will be to enlist developing countries in, in getting uh, this going. So that's enough for me about uh, some of the headlines uh, we've seen in the, uh, in the U.S. tax system. But we basically have a situation that, uh, you know, wanted to, to, to turn it over to Frank now and see what we can do about these, uh, these various ways in which the United States has become a leading haven. Hey, Jim, uh, can you... Uh... Uh, allow for screen sharing. Yeah, um, Thomas, can you allow him to share his screen?
Let me see. There's. I need to. I need to uh, put. I want to activate the video, the audio as well. Usually, when I when I open this thing, it'll show me. All right. Oh, maybe I won't be able to show the the ads. I can hear. You. Okay. Uh. I can hear you, but you've got. Yeah, no, there's, there's normally it allows me to, when I click into it, it gives me a thing and I can share my volume. Okay. Anyway, why don't I just, uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead and. Uh, hey, folks, uh, Frank Clemeni, Executive Director of Americans for Tax Fairness, a national coalition um, here in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, I just get a minute on my, on our mission, ATS mission. Uh, we, uh, our goal is to raise. $10 trillion over 10 years uh, for uh, investments in housing, healthcare, education, on down the line. Uh, the way we're looking at this fight this year, hopefully we can put a down payment on that, raising $3 trillion maybe uh, in the Biden Build Back Better plan, uh, which is what I'll talk to you about. <clears throat> and um, he has a he put forward as a presidential candidate, put forward a very ambitious investment agenda and a somewhat ambitious tax plan uh, especially as, as things go here in DC. And so, uh, you know, it was impressive and he ran on it, which is what I wanted to show you a little bit about. Uh, our, our goal is to require the wealthy corporations to pay their fair share of taxes to rebuild America for the 21st century. And uh, a product of that is to slash income inequality and close the racial wealth gap. Uh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna run through a few slides just to kind of give you the problem as we see it um, uh, and, uh, you know, frame it up. Uh, we've done a lot of work on U.S. billionaire wealth growth, uh, and it's, uh, it's off the charts. Uh, we've been tracking it during the pandemic. Uh, wealth growth of U.S. billionaires is 650-odd billionaires. It's now up uh, more than 50%, uh, actually just shy of 50% since March 18th uh, when we started accounting for it. Uh, and as you can see, the wealth of the U.S. billionaires, those are 650 people, swamps the wealth of the bottom 50% of the population. It's almost double. Uh, and as you hear a lot about is the top richest 0.1%. That's not even billionaires. Billionaires are probably 0.0001%. Anyway, the richest 0.01%, 0 0.1%. Uh, you can just see a uh, blue line here is the, the uh, income, the wealth owned by the bottom 90% and the wealth owned by the top 0.1%, uh, which is about 100,000 people. Uh, is almost similar. Uh, it's getting closer and closer together. And this is the richest 1% versus the bottom 90%. You can see the richest 1% actually has more than the bottom 9%, 90%. A uh, one percenter is somebody who's probably making about $700,000 a year. Um, the profound, we have a profound and growing racial wealth gap. Uh, as you are probably aware, this shows the not wealth. Well, this shows wealth, median household wealth, whites $170,000, uh, swamping black wealth and uh, Hispanic wealth. And also this slide basically helps you understand the importance of tax policy uh, in uh, addressing income inequality. This is a chart that shows <clears throat> um, US poverty rate before and after taxes and transfers. So that's before people are taxed, uh, taxing them to use that money for good things, uh, i.e. transfers, social security payments, housing supports, um, uh, you know, other kinds of income supports for folks at the bottom end. So you can see uh, the, uh, the, the poverty rate before these transfers happen from the rich down to the to folks at the lower income scale. Uh, they're, we're able to shrink their poverty rate from 27% down to 17% thanks to the beauty of uh, progressive tax system and then using those progressive tax revenues to invest in things that uh, really uh, improve people's lives. And then this slide, uh, Senator Bradley probably is familiar with this from one or two decades ago. Uh, it didn't look like this way back then. I forget, Senator, when you left Congress, but what this shows, the red line shows government outlays, how much the government spends each year uh, uh, for everything, everything from Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid uh, down to you know, the money that gets uh, granted out to state and local governments. So that red line, as you can see, is 23%. Uh, uh, 
at about 2030. You can see this huge spike there around 20, uh, 2020. That is the spike, uh, the huge outlays that are happening because of the pandemic. Um, and, but the really striking thing is you see federal uh, revenues essentially is relatively flat. Back in the 1970s, it was about 17%. And as you can see, uh, right around now, it's uh, closer to 16%, and it's going to go to about 18%. But that gap between the red line and the blue line is the federal deficit. Uh, and as you can see, it's getting bigger. Uh, at, and that's because we have an aging population. It's putting more demands on services. Uh, and uh, uh, they have higher health care costs, a lot baby boomers. 10 million a day going in the baby boomer, uh, going into retirement. And it's just putting a big demand on, on Social Security and on, on uh, Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera. Uh, but what we, the, I, the terrible thing uh, from my point of view is that the revenue number has remained flat over all these years. Uh, and we can, just cannot sustain ourselves. That's why you hear a lot about we're disinvesting in America. Uh, we just cannot make it unless we start raising a lot more revenue. So let me talk a little bit here about Biden's Build Back uh, agenda. He ran a very uh, strong uh, campaign. He amazingly was very concrete, both about his spending plans, and uh, he calls them investment plans, and about his tax plan. Uh, more complete, uh, more, more, more uh, specific, I would say, and more, more detailed and more ambitious than I think almost any presidential, certainly any presidential candidate in modern times, and I mean presidential general election candidate. He was not nearly as ambitious as Senator Warren or Senator Sanders who ran for the Democratic nomination, but in terms of a general election candidate, he was very ambitious. He himself articulated about a set of programs that's about six and a half trillion dollars. Other outsiders have said, uh, well, it's clo closer to $11 trillion. This gives you some of the feel for how he distributed his uh, investments, $2 trillion for rebuilding infrastructure and clean energy. And that's the basis of this next plan that he's going to put forward in Congress uh, within a month or two. Uh, $2 trillion uh, major expenditures to health care access and affordability, largely beefing up the Affordable Care Act and also making uh, Medicare eligible for folks down to age 60. It's currently, you have to be 65 to get Medicare. A whole chunk of money to Child care, universal pre K, free public community college, and paying down student debt, uh, a big chunk for affordable housing. He had a whole piece of work on a strengthening Social Security, helping folks, low income poverty, uh, folks who are in poverty on Social Security uh, by raising the social supplemental security income substantially. Um, uh, and then another 500 billion or so in the working family tax credit area, EITC and CTC. Interesting thing to note, both uh, the major expansions to healthcare, uh, he, he did that in this pandemic bill that just passed. Uh, it's a two year, uh, it's, it's, it's in place for two years. It, after two years, it goes away, but it helps people afford insurance and expands Medicaid to reach more folks. And then this working family tax credits, there's a big boost there. You keep hearing about this pandemic plan, how it's gonna uh, cut child poverty in half. It is through the child tax credit that it does that, uh, but it's only a one-year program. So it goes away uh, in 2022, uh, and Biden wants to make that uh, permanent. To make that permanent is a trillion dollars, so it's a big chunk of change, and he's going to have to pay for it in his next bill if that's what he's going to do. Um, let me catch my breath for a minute. I know I'm going a little bit fast. I hope it's not uh, too fast for you. A little slower than what Jim did, even. Um, <laughs> No, it's pretty terrific, uh, and there's a lot of material. If any students have questions or they want to raise a hand, uh, you, you know how to do that using the, uh, uh, the screen sharing and the chat bars. But, uh, you know, j feel free to just forge on because there's, you know, inevitably, it, this is a dense thicket that we're wading through. So uh, Biden's agenda on taxes. So we just talked about the investment agenda. He said it was about six and a half trillion dollars. I like to say he stopped counting after a certain <laughs> point of time. And it really is more like 10 or $11 trillion. So hugely ambitious. Uh, his tax agenda was more modest, about $3 trillion, $4 trillion. Uh, uh, it starts by repealing the Trump GOP tax cuts, just those things that benefit the rich and corporations. 
Uh, and it doesn't fully repeal, some of it roll, is rolling back. For instance, uh, the corporate tax rate, uh, Trump cut it from 35% to 21%. Biden will put it back halfway to 28%. Um, Biden closes a bunch of offshore tax loophole, one in particular, one very large tax loophole. Right now, under the Trump tax cuts, the effective tax rate that a, a multinational pays on its offshore profits is about 11%, uh, whereas what it's paying on its domestic profits is 21%. And from our point of view and from the labor movement's point of view and others, there's a real problem with that rate differential. It puts a real premium on shipping, uh, uh, on um, doing production offshore, because you pay a 10 percentage point, you pay about half the tax rate on offshore profits that you would on your onshore profits. And also, um, uh, it gives you this incentive to make it look like your profits are being generated offshore when it's really the intellectual property you developed here, your drug patents or your uh, uh, software patents. Uh, these multinationals are able to, they basically sell the ownership of those patents to their subsidiaries and tax haven countries. And then they lease it back here to the American corporation. The American corporation uh, pays the money that goes into the Cayman Islands subsidiary, what have you. And, does a lot of tax dodging that way. So Biden does a big thing to close one of the key offshore tax loopholes there. So he would raise the effective tax rate on offshore uh, on offshore profits from about 11% to 21%. And then the domestic rate would be 28%. So the rate differential is not so great. That's closer together. One very important structural thing that Biden does is he, uh, the, the capital gains income. Capital gains are <clears throat> income you derive when you sell your stock, or you sell your business and you have to pay taxes on your business, uh, or you get you get dividend income uh, uh, from your stocks. Uh, the capital gains tax rate is uh, twenty percent, uh, whereas the rate that a rich person pays on their salary is thirty-seven percent. So the capital gains in, in, uh, tax rate is almost half of what it is on the uh, rich person's uh, income. So. That's why somebody like Jeff Bezos only pays himself about $87,000 a year working for Amazon in salary. Uh, most of his income is coming in stock. So he pays a 37% tax rate on his, on his uh, $87,000, but he pays only a 20% tax rate on the Amazon stock that he sells. Uh, so Biden wants to change that. And frankly, all of the Democrats who ran for Congress want to change that and equalize the capital gains rate so that it, it rises up to equal the tax rate on salaries uh, at income of a million dollars or more. And uh, that's not good enough though to raise money. You have to close some of the loopholes that exist or the ways that folks can avoid paying that tax. Uh, you only pay that tax if you actually sell it, if you actually realize it. Uh, and if you don't realize it, there's no tax to be paid. Well, Biden basically gets rid of a, a nice loophole for the wealthy uh, that would force them to realize it. And that is to make them, if, if, the, if their investments or stocks are passed on to their heirs, uh, it, it, he essentially says, treats it as if they're being sold. And so all the capital gains that had occurred the entire life that the, uh, per, the decedent had, had avoided taxes on them, they will have to be paid as they get passed on to their heir. That raises about $450 billion. Uh, Biden has a 28% cap on uh, deductions, how much you can take uh, the deductions against your income, uh, he caps it at 28%. You can't go all the way up to your top rate of 37%. He also restores the estate tax to 2009 levels. Uh, and these are some of the big changes. And these are some of the big things that are going to be fought over uh, when he releases his tax plan. Not even clear how many Democrats will be on, on board that. He also, his tax plan gives away a lot of money uh, in tax credits to uh, families, uh, family caregivers, uh, through the EITC, the child tax credit, home buyers, first time home buyers, retirement, middle class retirees, not wealthy retirees, and, and a big chunk for domestic manufacturing. So that's kind of a, a quick sketch of his tax plan. It's complicated. It's not easy to explain to a lot of folks. Most people don't do numbers. And most people don't know much, anything about capital gains because most people don't have investments in stocks and things like that, at least what that they're not very aware of. Any questions? So another important thing, uh, to, to win on these issues, one has to win the message war. Uh, mm -hmm. And now I'm gonna talk about politics for just a minute. 
And winning the message war is, um, uh, you know, it's like uh, for, for years, the message war was, well, trickle down supply side economics, uh, give tax breaks to the rich and corporations and it'll bet, bet, benefit the rest of us. That was the message war that Ronald Reagan uh, won on when he ran a president in 1980. And it kind of dominated our politics for many years. We think that things have changed. We think that the public, I know from our own polling, we do a lot of polling on these issues, that the public is very much in favor of a fair share taxes agenda. Uh, and uh, this slide is from John Anzalone, who was the pollster for Biden. Uh, and what he found was that they had tested proposals to raise taxes on the wealthy who were the most popular of more than 30 economic proposals that were tested uh, in 2020 when Biden ran for president. Uh, and uh, whether paired with closing tax loopholes for big corporations or using the money to invest in priorities like lowering healthcare costs, improving education, strengthening Social Security Medicare, proposals that raise taxes on the wealthy uh, and corporations to outperform all other economic proposals tested in their 2020 camp polling among both independents and voters overall. I emphasize this in all of our work with, with Democratic officials. They are, are, there's a lot of um, uh, reluctance by uh, many Democrats, especially those who are swing Democrats in, in tougher districts, to embrace this tax fairness agenda, to embrace this agenda that we can tax the rich and tax corporations, make them pay their fair share of taxes in order to create an economy that works for all of us. But it's a winning message. And part of the way we're going to win this debate, win on Biden's tax plan this year, is getting more and more organizations and more and more Democratic officials saying that. Uh, and so that's kind of your quick lesson in messaging and how you influence the debate. <laughs> that's um, a great, great thing. All right, good. I'd love to show you this, but I don't think you're going to, you guys can hear it. And so let me just see if you can hear this. We can. We can? Yep. Sort of. Almost. No, not quite. I think we're hearing it by way of you. <laughs> so. Now, the reason I wanted, could you hear the audio or was it hard to hear? A little bit hard. Okay. The reason I wanted to show you that is uh, this shows you that when you run in a full throat away on these issues, so Biden, he, he actually ran tax ads more commonly than any other ad he had in, uh, in the end of t September and th halfway through October. Uh, a bunch of that was he was defending himself against Trump, uh, but uh, a bunch of it, he was putting his whole agenda forward. And he showed that you can, and this is happening in battleground states, if you're in Connecticut or you're in Washington, D.C., you don't see this, but you would have seen it out there on the, on the, in, the, in a swing state. The point is that this is a winning message, and the only way you're going to win this debate in Congress uh, is to be forthright and be strong uh, and be bold and, and make the case. So uh, I will not play this one. This is, a, uh, this is him talking about his pandemic message. Uh, if, maybe if I, well, you, you said you couldn't really hear it. I can hear it through you. Through uh, I, I have a one minute video. Do you want me to show, this shows him talk, pivoting to what his Build Back Better agenda is gonna be. You wanna see that or should I? Yeah, it? yeah, let's try it. Okay. No, it's still not coming. It's not coming through. Yeah, he's, he's talking too loud. Okay. Tell us what. Tell us what he's saying. So. Well, what he's saying is he's, um, I, I'm, I put forward to you, he's announcing, I, I'm putting forward my pandemic relief plan of $1.9 trillion. Uh, and he essentially says that that's a uh, critical emergency and that's not going to be paid for. We need to deficit finance it. We're in an economic crisis. He says, but I'm gonna come back to Congress in a few months, which will be April or May. We're not sure when he's gonna make this speech. And, to, and, and lay out for you a longer range, a long-term investment agenda that we need to build back better. Uh, and that is going to go to education and infrastructure and creating jobs and uh, et cetera. And that plan, we're going to pay for it. We're going to ask uh, uh, 
the richest Americans to pay their share. I'm going to ask corporations to do the same. He actually talks about corporation, 90 corporations that don't pay taxes, things like that. So anyway, that's his message. My point of this is, these, this is this is was his framing up what the debate is going to be shortly, uh, and that's going to start. He'll make a speech to Congress about his plan, and I believe he will give this juxtaposition between which side are you on, right? You, you can be on the side of working families and get uh, help create long-term investments to help make the economy more productive and benefit everybody, and we're going to ask the rich and corporations to pay a little bit more to help finance that. That's that's the gist. Uh, I've just, I'll just finish up uh, our strategy around this stuff uh, this year is uh, uh, A, to, we're working with Biden to ensure that he proposes the kinds of tax plans that he, he proposed during the campaign. So we're trying again to propose at least $3 trillion in new revenue towards our goal of $10 trillion uh, over 10 years. Uh, the process is just like this pandemic relief bill that just passed, became law, uh, passed, uh, did not could not be stopped in the Senate with a filibuster. There's a special rule, it's called budget reconciliation that allows a, a spending and, and a revenue bill measure like this to go through without, uh, with just a majority vote, no filibuster. That's what, that will happen. There'll be a bunch of jockeying before that, like is this gonna be bipartisan or not, that sort of thing. This will not be a bipartisan piece of legislation. Republicans are, standing and totally against raising revenue. And so you can't obviously do a bill with them that requires raising revenue. Our strategy is we've got to mobilize big time the progressive community behind the plan. We need to get moderate Democrats to move to our position. Too many of them are reluctant to take a position on taxes. We have a robust mobilization or media strategy in at least eight target states. Uh, and then we have to win the message war this year because that helps us win the message war next year so we can change the overall narrative on this stuff. Uh, I'll stop there. That's terrific, Frank. Thank you. Students, questions? Let me jump in. Uh, talk about the political uh, viability. Is this a knife's edge? Uh, that we're on here. Uh, you can't use reconciliation to get any of these tax measures. And secondly, um, the wealth tax. Uh, how much support is there within the Democratic Party now for a wealth tax on billionaires? So um, we have a halfway decent chance. Uh, taxes is part of reconciliation. In fact, taxes is, uh, you need you sort of need taxes to do reconciliation because you have to under reconciliation you more or less have to pay for things. <laughs> I mean, you can have you can say X amount, you can say it's all going to be deficit finance, but typically it's not. There's there's revenue measures. So uh, a bill will go forward. The question is going to be how big is that bill going to be, and there, it, how big it is is going to depend on how much they're willing to raise taxes. It's a dial up or dial down issue. So the more they're willing to raise taxes. The more revenue they're willing to raise, the bigger the investment agenda can be. Uh, the less willing they are, the smaller the package is going to be. I believe the president will propose some chunk of the reconciliation package to be deficit finance. Uh, most likely, it would be the infrastructure portion of it, uh, and he can more credibly make the case that that's an investment. We got to borrow the money for it short term. Uh, interest costs are really low for a long-term investment in infrastructure. Um, and I think initially you may see some, can we work with Republicans just to put an infrastructure proposal forward? Uh, but I can't imagine that goes very far. Uh, on the question of the wealth tax in here, um, so uh, we actually worked with Senator War Warren, uh, Elizabeth Warren, uh, two weeks ago, and in the House, a couple of members, uh, we int they introduced wealth tax legislation. Uh, it was modeled on the proposal that Senator Warren did in the campaign. It's a two percentage point tax on wealth between uh, 50, billion, $50 million and $1 billion and a 3% tax on wealth above $1 billion. Uh, uh, it's proposed it would raise $3 trillion, uh, the rough amount that Biden probably will put forward. Um, we actually did uh, an analysis of our billionaires and our billionaires would uh, alone would contribute about 1.4 billion based on their wealth. Uh, last year, uh, they would contribute about 1.4 trillion of that $3 trillion uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
toward, towards it. Um, it. It's broadly, it's very popular. It's the most popular thing with the public. Uh, it's not terribly popular with members, with a, a, a lot of members of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, and I honestly don't know why. <laughs> uh, given how popular it is with the public, given how simple it is to explain, uh, taxes are really hard to explain to people. Uh, as you saw in the slideshow when I detailed Biden's tax plan, I'm sure I lost most of you rather quickly, especially when I started talking about capital gains taxes uh, and the differential rates and all that sort of stuff. The wealth tax is simple, clean. Uh, there are, um, uh, you know, there's questions about whether it's constitutional or not. There's scholars on both sides of that debate to say it is and say it's not. Uh, my view, view is let's, let, let's decide that one in the court of public opinion and we'll worry about the, uh, the uh, Supreme Court later on. Um, but um, so uh, we are working, we, our core focus is on the Biden tax agenda because that's gonna be more likely to be acceptable to Congress, but we're gonna use the wealth tax uh, and our support for it just to explain to the public in a simpler way <laughs> what's at stake. Be able to juxtapose the the growth of billionaire wealth during the pandemic, it's up 44% versus most of you who've stood still or many of you lost, you know, tens of millions lost your jobs. If we can sort of make those sort of contrast for people, comparisons, trade-offs, I think it's, it's, it's a good way to move the agenda forward message-wise. Can you put uh, some of your contacts and maybe any recommended readings in the chat? Uh, just Frank. Just uh, yeah, through. actually, well, I, I, I have uh, on my PowerPoint, I actually. Uh, that's I in the chat. Yeah, that's in the chat. Share the PowerPoint. I'm happy to. I can. Uh, I don't know what would happen if I copy. Hold on. Um, you can upload a file. I, I, yeah, I don't know if I can. I've got these are URLs in the PowerPoint. If I, let me see what happens if I dump them into um, yeah. the chat and see if, see, oops, see if you can, if the URLs work. They probably don't. I wanted to turn now while you're still on the line here, because I knew you had to run off, but uh, to Senator Bradley for a perspective from where he stands in terms of, you know, the, the period of uh, Reaganomics, you know, when Walter Mondale famously said, I will raise taxes. And, uh, you know, I think uh, that whole era when Democrats seem to be moving the other direction away from taxation. Uh, how, Bill, does it strike you now as uh, we're in a different phase where we can turn Reaganomics on its head, uh, as Frank seems to be proposing here, that uh, government spending uh, is back? Yeah, I, I think that Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton were the two people who uh, dealt a serious blow to the idea that government can accomplish real things. Reagan, by saying, uh, that you know, government. Reagan made a point about how bad government was, and then Clinton backed it up at one point by saying, "The era of big government is over." Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, that was the bookend for that period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you a brief history, if you want, of that, and then lay out some various uh, tax alternatives. Not spending as much time on uh, the Biden agenda, because Frank has done a comprehensive job of, of laying that out, but prepare to come back to that. If you recall, when Ronald Reagan was elected president, the tax rate on income was 70%. And he uh, proposed uh, the so-called Kemp Roth tax cut, which was a 30% tax cut across the board. Uh, it passed in 1981, uh, cutting the top tax rate from uh, 70 to 50. Um, however, the result of that was it defunded government and created a gigantic deficit. Mm -hmm. So in probably the least uh, focused on element of the Reagan tax policy, in 1982, he passed a massive bill that closed loopholes. It was the largest tax in, uh, in his, in, in, since World War II in terms of tax increase. Uh, and it was to make up for 
the lost revenue. For example, in 1981 on depreciation, they uh, allowed buildings which are normally depreciated at 30% to be depreciated 15%, I, I, over 15 years, not 30 years, but 15 years. So you had palaces being built all over Washington uh, and the taxpayers essentially paying for that. Um, so Reagan, uh, and then we come to, uh, in the early period of, of Reagan, I mean, one of the reasons I went into politics was because I wanted to make the system fair, the tax system fair. And so I define tax reform as uh, closing loopholes and lowering rates. And that was, uh, I wrote a book about it called The Fair Tax. Um, and I remember in 1984, Walter Mondale, I went to uh, Dick Gephardt, who was a congressman back then, a leader in the House, and I went to Mondale and suggested that he take our general proposal, which cut tax rates and eliminated loopholes. And Mondale, who had been a member of the Finance Committee for 15 years in the Senate, uh, felt that it was impossible to close loopholes. And therefore, uh, he was not going to go along with it. And Charlie Rangel, who was a ranking member on the Ways and Means Committee, uh, seconded that motion. However, Ronald Reagan heard that uh, this idea was out there and Mondale was considering it. So what Ronald Reagan did was propose a study of income taxes. And the study would of course not be, uh, not reported till after the election, thereby giving him, if Mondale went this way, a cover saying, well, we're looking at it, we have a study. The study that came out was done by tax professionals at Treasury. It was not done by politicos. And it ended up being a very solid proposal that resulted in suggesting uh, rate cuts and loophole closings. Uh, that went back and forth through several iterations. Um, and then uh, in 1985, I remember writing a book, as I said, called The Fair Tax, and Jim Baker became the uh, finance, the, the treasury, became the treasury secretary, and he had a real interest in this. And so uh, basically joined forces, and the result was the 1986 tax reform bill which cut tax rates from 50 to 28%, which is what many people focus on. But what they don't focus on is we closed loopholes that were used primarily by the wealthy. The general idea, equal income should pay equal tax. And, equal in, and if you had a loophole that you got in the tax code, you paid less tax than your neighbor who made the same amount of money. And so we passed it and it ended up in the years after, there are a couple of reforms in that bill that are significant related to what we're discussing here today. We eliminated the uh, exclusion for capital gains. There was no capital gains when we passed this bill. It was eliminated as a part of the bill. Um, now the top rate was 28, but uh, it was still, there was no differential. Uh, the other thing that we discovered was since most, since the wealthy overwhelmingly used the loopholes, that in the year, in the two or three years before, uh, you know, Clinton came in and changed the, the, the tax law again, uh, in the two or three years, the top 5% of the uh, earners in America paid a higher percent of the total taxes raised than before the law passed, giving you some idea of how unfair the system was with the wealthy using loopholes to lower their taxes and those not being available to working people. We also dramatically expanded the earned income tax credit in, in that bill. So that was a, a significant uh, piece of legislation in those years. And it was one of those things that um, if you're a tax practitioner, a tax lawyer, 
who's paid enormous sums of money to find arcane provisions in the code that were put into the law by Senator X or Congressman Y at the behest of a contributor or a friend or whatever, you know how riddled the tax code is with little special provisions that have built up like barnacles on a, on a, on a wall uh, over you know, decades. Uh, the best example of that that I always referred to when I was giving these speeches is that, um, you know, there, uh, there was a provision in the code, I think it's still in the code, where if you rent your house for two weeks or less, <clears throat> you will pay no income tax on that rental. Now, where did that come from? That came from a senator in Georgia named Herman Talmadge being reached by several people who had giant houses at the uh, Masters Golf Tournament. And so <clears throat> it, he eliminated that. So when they rented their houses, they paid no tax on the money. That, that, that's just an example of how riddled the system was with uh, loopholes. So we made a big dent in that. Um, and of course, literally, literally uh, about four months, maybe max six months after the bill passed, all the lobbyists from Wall Street were back in saying, we got to have a uh, capital gains differential. We got to have a capital gains differential. And um, so uh, I told them, look, if you have the capital gains differential, you, what's going to happen is rates are going to go back up. Do you want a low rate system or you want a high rate system? And they, of course, opted for and got Bill Clinton's ear, and he raised the rates to 39 and then put back in the capital gains, then I think at, uh, <clears throat> at 20 or 25. <clears throat> so you're kind of square one. So this whole tax reform effort lasted about two years or three years, and then it was essentially eaten away and repealed over time. And the question really is, is um, you know, I always believe that those who have more should pay more, equal income should pay equal taxes. And so what kind of systems should you have to do that? As uh, Justice Brandeis once said, something like taxes are the price we pay for our civilization. And so how do you want them raised? You want them raised in the fairest possible way. Uh, we have had since uh, 1990 a dramatic shift in uh, less and less taxes for people who have uh, sizable incomes. And I think we're now at a point where <clears throat> the Biden tax proposal is an example of the, the effort to, uh, to restore some fairness to the tax system. And I, I have my issues with some elements of it, but overall, I think, and I agree with Frank, the clearest thing to say, the clearest tax to pass would be a 2% tax on wealth over $50 million. Now, how many people does that affect? That affects a small, small number of people, right? And would you rather have that tax or would you rather have all these other things about over a million dollars, capital gains equals income, blah, blah, blah. You, you would, there's a lot of reason to clean up the income tax system. But if you had the wealth tax, that would by far be the cleanest. And I agree with Frank 100%, the easiest to explain. There is, however, the problem of constitutionality. As Frank said, some are on, say it is constitutional, some say it's not constitutional. The issue of constitutionality hinges on can the federal government tax property? And state and local can, but can the federal government tax property? And that would be the issue that the Supreme Court would decide. And I'm, I'm dubious that they would rule and say, yes, it could given this court, but you, know, you never know, you never know. Uh, on another aspect that Frank talked about, which I thought was really good, was, you know, you need to have a system where the, well, the wealthy can't, he used Jeff Bezos as an example, where, uh, you know, he, he, would, he would give up 
uh, he, he doesn't earn his money by wages because he only makes $89,000 a year, but he earns his money by capital gains where he pays only 20%. He earns his money neither by capital gains nor by regular income. He doesn't earn any, what he does is he borrows against the value of his stock. So he pays no tax, no capital gains, no other tax. He borrows against the stock value and he then essentially uh, uh, lives off of those loans. Now, one of the things that I thought is there a way that we could disallow deduction for interest on loans uh, of people above a certain income or, or a certain wealth level as a way to also test the idea of the wealth tax. I mean, so. That's a great job. I mean, that's David K. Johnson makes that point that uh, basically a lot of super rich uh, are deeply in debt and uh, they favorite their private bankers are uh, financing their lifestyles with the interest deductible loans. Right, which of course is a really good way to go if you want to hit that level of people because you raise rates, that's not going to affect them. They don't, they don't pay any tax. Right. And so now the other possibility is two other possibilities I would allude to is one is your favorite, which is a transa transaction tax on the sale of stocks, which as you point out, it's been in the books in New York for a hundred years almost and uh, is now only rebated to back. And to me, that it's a kind of no-brainer. The so-called so Tobin tax would be a no-brainer. But in order for it to really work, you really need to have international cooperation. And uh, it, it's worth making the effort because a very small amount generates a very large amount of, of revenue. Um, the other thing you could do is you could say, particularly in the last year, uh, you know, in COVID times, uh, those people who had financial assets, uh, they've done very well. I mean, the market's up 70%, right, from the low point in March. But for those who have only wage income, they've had a lot of problems. And so if there was some way you could put in, I remember one of the things, my first, my first uh, bill in the Senate was a windfall profits tax on oil because the price of oil, courtesy of the o OPEC cartel, increased 400%. And of course, the oil companies got the benefit of that because it was one global price. So we taxed the windfall profits tax of those oil companies. Now you could tax the windfall profit tax, you could tax the windfall profits of people who made income from the sale of stock during this year during this year, in which case you uh, would, I don't know how much revenue that would raise, but that would raise, could raise a significant amount. So I think those are the other thing, the other kinds of taxes that people have talked about, a value added tax, which most countries in the world have, offset by a very large uh, exclusion uh, thereby making it less, uh, less, uh, uh, more, more, op more progressive, not uh, and not regress, not as regressive as it would be otherwise. Um, and the other thing is, uh, you know, a tax on carbon, and taking the tax on carbon, and using the revenue to reduce the Social Security tax thereby taxing those things we don't like, carbon that pollutes the environment, tax them more and tax those things you do like, like work uh, less by reducing the social security tax. That would be revenue neutral in order for it to work. It would not be uh, increasing taxes by $3 trillion, but it has a lot of very strong public policy reasons now, the Biden tax program, I think, is a really interesting one. I agree with Frank. That's the game in town, so you got to play in that game, even though I'd sure like to have an element of that to test the wealth tax. Um, so I look at this and I say, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, tax policy is a little bit like sausage. You know, you don't like to see how it's made, but you like to taste it. So uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a very interesting year. That plays into the dynamics. Uh, I do not think there will be a tax bill until late 21. Uh, it'll have to be the next budget resolution because that's when you can have reconciliation again. And, and when you can pass a tax bill with 51 votes and not 60 votes in the United States Senate. So I think this year is going to give an opportunity. And I have a lot of conversations with Ron Wyden, who's the chairman of the finance committee about how to accomplish these objectives. And I think that everybody knows what the objectives are. That is, the upper income people have to pay more. Even upper income people say, I'll pay more, right? But then when they get to specifics, some of them drop off. But I think that everybody knows that's what has to happen. And the question of what among these alternatives would achieve that the best? David Leighton, you had a question? I did, I have a question, thank you. Uh, I guess it's for, for Frank or Senator Bradley or you, Jim. I think, you know, for someone like me who's uh, not an expert in tax, I, I often have this question come up of, you know, how much of issues with our tax system are, are really just uh, part of the bigger issue with special interests, having lobbying be too, too powerful corporations making too much of public policy um, and how much of this is really specific to the tax universe itself. Uh, so uh, maybe, maybe one way to ask the question would be, you know, if we just fix the issues with, with the, the lobbying and corporations making too much public policy, would the tax issue resolve itself or, or do we need to think really specifically about it too? Uh, I think you need to do both, but I will tell you, if you had public financing of elections, if Citizens United was repealed, which allows you to then ta uh, ha have campaign finance reform, that would dramatically decrease the amount of lobbying energy for getting things into the tax code. Um, it would not eliminate it, because every senator would be trying to help his state in some way. And the only thing that really eliminates this on the income tax side is having the income tax for the purpose of raising revenue, not for making social or economic policy. When the, uh, I think Frank alluded to the first, or Jim, to the first income tax, the first income tax was 1% on income over $3,000. That affected 3% of the population. Mm -hmm. And as the, co the country grew, it taxed more and more people and more and more people and more and more people until you have this current system. And so I think having the income tax system raise revenue and not do social policy or economic policy would, I think, be the other way that you could really eliminate special interests because there'd be no loopholes. Well, I'd, I'd add to the conversation. Now. I mean, we have this unique problem here in America where we have an entire political party that is against raising taxes. And, um, and at least at the federal level, but pretty, pretty, up down up and down the line so and until that party sees a political interest in um, government in uh, the good good things government can do the power of government to, to improve people's lives and therefore you need to finance government uh, adequately um, you know we have problems so it's it's both things ideology sometimes flows from campaign contributions, but oftentimes it sort of runs parallel with it. And in this case, I think it runs pretty parallel. Uh, now, the folks that uh, Republicans associate more at home in the past, country club Republicans has been wealthier folks. The folks, um, you know, big corporations in their state bring jobs. That has a lot of sway with Democrats and Republicans. So 
uh, it's not just the campaign contributions, it's uh, how, to what extent are these entities engines of economic growth and therefore they have sway over, over politicians that way. So. And, and Republicans also have uh, another problem. Um, and the 2017 tax bill is an example of that. And the recent stimulus bill is exhibit B. The stimulus bill received no, not one single Republican vote, right? And the disproportionate benefit of the, of the, of the stimulus bill went to low income people and middle income people. In 2017, by far the, the, the biggest benefit went to the wealthiest people and to corporations. So if you are out there saying you are a uh, populist party and you know there were a lot of middle income, low income Americans who voted for Trump and the Republicans, you're a populist party and then you don't do anything to help the people who elected you at some point that's going to come back and bite you. Radion had his uh, hand up. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Clemente and Senator Bradley for talking to us. My question, both of you mentioned in your presentations that some portion of the tax reform might end up in the Supreme Court. So I was wondering whether, to your knowledge, there had been any previous rulings on similar tax reforms and what you anticipate the result to be and where the courts rule against the tax reforms, what you think that might mean for the future of tax reform in this country? Well, the first income tax was passed by Abraham Lincoln, and it was about a 3% tax. Uh, then that uh, was replaced by tariffs. Uh, and the uh, tax income tax was declared unconstitutional under the guise taxing property, right? And it required a constitutional amendment that was passed that said, no, the federal government may tax income. And so that was an example of where the court weighed in and made things possible. Could it do that on a wealth tax? It could do that on a wealth tax. But the tax reform that uh, Frank was talking about with Biden or the things I was talking about in 86 or uh, any of these other, they don't need, to, they won't be reviewed by the Supreme Court because it's a very, it's in the context of current law. Only if you have a wealth tax does the Supreme Court enter the picture here. I would just add to that that the stock transfer tax in New York, which was incidentally introduced by a Republican in 1905, a problem solving progressive Republican who just wanted the revenue to fix the deficit, uh, was upheld by the Supreme Court in terms of constitutionality in uh, 1907. And just two years ago, the Supreme Court found that uh, New York State would be able to tax internet transactions from Amazon, even if they were. Uh, locating the computers offshore. So there's a strong argument that uh, in favor of all the requisite elements of the financial transactions tax in, in US law uh, from the standpoint of simply raising revenue. Frank, did you have any comment on that legal question? No, I'm good with the senator's answer. I guess what I'm, my question is, here's the political question on the wealth tax. Uh, how do you guys account for the fact that the American people find it just kind of brain dead simple that we uh, you know, should be adopting it? What is the hang up in Washington? Is it simply uh, the affection of both ruling parties for the, for the top 1%? Or is it the number of millionaires in Congress? Uh, or is yeah, it most of them would not be affected. I think it's a socialization. I think it's, well, one, I think it, there's a, just a, there's, there's no question it's complex to do a wealth tax. Um, and so, you know, how do you figure that out is a, is a, is a true challenge. Uh, I'm confident that uh, everybody can do it. There, there is an alternative to the wealth tax that Warren has proposed and Senator Wyden, who, uh, Senator Bradley knows well. It, it's a it's a tax called mark to market, where basically 
you could you would tax all of uh, any assets that's tradable, stocks, bonds, derivatives, where you get an annual report. Here's what you were worth. Here's what this <laughs> was worth at the beginning of the year. Here's what it's worth at the end of the year. Uh, you would be taxed on that growth in wealth. And if you lost money, you would get a break at the, at the back end. You wouldn't owe taxes and you'd, you'd get some sort of a refund or credit or whatever. On your non-tradable assets, the business you own, the yacht you bought, the real estate you're invested in, you wouldn't be taxed on that year to year because those are non-tradable. They're harder to value. It's, it's more complicated to value it. And so you wouldn't pay taxes right away. You would pay taxes when they were sold uh, and the tax would be based on how much you paid for it and how much you sold it for. Plus you would have to pay an interest charge for all those years you, you avoided taxes on the money. Uh, that is certainly more workable constitutionally. We have less concern about that being challenged. Um, it's more, it's less, it, it kind of works within the existing capital gain system. Uh, it's damn hard to explain to people. Um, and so we'll make it very hard to, uh, to, to win on that. I think that there is a, it's the new, it is partly the newness of it. Um, they're used to, uh, income taxes, they're used to capital gains taxes, they're not used to taxing wealth. And so it's partly they have to get used to that idea and that, that has to come from the ground up. It's not gonna necessarily come from Washington down. Um, um, and uh, other than that, I can't sort of, uh, for the life of me, I'm not quite sure. I mean, it really literally affects 100,000 households. <laughs> It's not like there's a big constituency out there. Yeah, it's an influential one, but I, I think there's something psychological about taxing wealth. I guess if, if there was, you know, if I was to psychoanalyze it, there's something about taxing wealth that is a hang up for, for at least for those folks who are comfortable with taxing people, there's still a hang up for them around that. Senator Bradley? Uh, I think that um, it's very simple to explain to an audience. It's not simple to explain how it will actually work. And that is the problem. And then you have the constitutional problem. Uh, you know, I think was one, I think I don't know whether it was Frank or you, Jim, who said that, uh, you know, the Republicans don't want to raise taxes. Uh, back in 86, we recognized that each party had to get something that they wanted out of the bill. Democrats wanted to close loopholes. Republicans wanted to cut rates. Well, it was a pretty good deal. You can cut rates, but you have to close loopholes if you don't, because you have to offset the rate cut. And you do that by closing loopholes. I remember a story, I, I was not invited to the White House very much during the Reagan years, but there was this one year, year when we had the uh, Finance Committee <clears throat> there. And so, um, the, the, you know, 12, 15 people sitting around the table and uh, the chief of said, would you want to say anything to the president? And they go around, when they come to me, I said, Mr. President, I know you're interested in tax reform, lowering rates, because when you were an actor, the rates were 90%, which is what they were in the 50s. And I said, Mr. President, I'm interested in tax reform, which is closing loopholes, because as a basketball player, I was a, I was a depreciable asset, which is true, you could depreciate players' contracts. So if you have a, pro a plan where there's a little bit for both sides in this, then you, uh, you really have, I, I think the best chance, and it passed the Senate in 97 to three. You'll never have another ta tax bill pass the Senate 97 to three. And it did so because both sides saw that they had something in it that they, that they wanted. Now, since that time, which I think that was a balanced approach, since that time it skewed way up to the wealthy. So now the only way you can get back to where you were in 1986 is by increasing taxes on the wealthy. Harrison, you had a question. 
Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, have, I have a couple of questions. The first thing is to yourself, um, Frank, and you talked about uh, the need for raising 11 trillion over 10 years. And you also talked about the fact that the revenue tax revenue is stagnating while um, federal costs are, are, are going up. Um, it, it seems like we probably need a more than a 10 year plan to deal with the sort of current and uh, future future problems we're going to face in terms of climate and an, and an aging population in particular. So I guess my, my first question is like what the the uh, at a high level what that plan looks like. Um, and then my next question is um, that we've been talking a lot the past you know hour or so about um, problems with taxes at like the federal level, but it seems that there's also a big problem in the US with uh, income tax differentials between states. There's a big thing right now about Californians moving to, you know, Miami or to, to, to Texas. And like um, the fact, I think I read like that a huge part of California's state budget is dependent on a tiny percentage of Californians um, paying, paying, paying tax, ta paying those taxes. And if they, they just move to, to, to Austin or wherever, California has got a huge problem. So, you know, how can that issue be addressed in, in America too? Yeah, well, you're, um, I've actually just started to spend a bunch of time thinking more about state tax policy. We don't have the bandwidth to do state tax issues, but um, actually the case I was trying to make uh, to folks is to help them see the stake they have in the federal tax fight. A third of state budgets come from the federal government. Uh, and it's Medicaid money, it's food stamps, housing, infrastructure, environment. Most folks out there don't even understand that, how important federal revenue is or federal spending is to state and local governments. Uh, and uh, one other quick point on that, and then I'll go to the, the first question. The, um, uh, the, you know, there's this huge fear right now that the, uh, in the red states, we have a, a at least 16 or 20 states where Republicans control both chambers of the legislature and the uh, governor's ship. And what they're going to do with their pandemic relief money is they're going to actually use it to lower their taxes uh, this year in the legislature because they've got this infusion of federal money coming in so they can run next year. 34 state governorships are up for election next year. They can run next year saying, I lowered your taxes even though it's essentially the federal money that's coming in that is giving them this cushion to do that. And we've got states like West Virginia, Mississippi, their, their initiative right now is to lower, to get rid of their state income taxes. So we've got a huge problem across the country with taxation. I was on the phone recently with folks in, Denver, in Colorado. You know, they're, they, every kind of two year or two, they try and put a ballot initiative on to, to just increase taxes to pay for education, they can't get the darn thing passed, and that's a purple state. So we've got uh, not, it's not just the tax competition that you're talking about with, you know, the billionaires and a billionaire wealth tax in Washington State, wealth tax in California, wealth tax in, in New York. If those get passed, are the billionaires going to leave? Uh, but it's just it's an even more fundamental level. And also, most of the state and local taxes are regressive taxes, sales taxes, excise taxes, uh, and it's. Um, property taxes. And so what you actually see when you look at the entire, when you look at the U US taxpayers, people at the low end are paying a much higher percentage of their income, over 10% of their income is being paid in taxes where folks at the top end, it's down around six or 7%, it's almost half because uh, so much of the state tax burden is on the is on the low income folks because of the regressivity of it. Even, even though they're not, a lot of them aren't paying federal taxes, they're paying payroll taxes, but not, uh, not, not federal income taxes. Uh, my, the 10-year the window, look, I'll be happy if we can plan for 10 years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this country, as the senator knows, it's just like one or two years is the planning horizon. There's no planning. Uh, and uh, I give Biden credit because he's really trying to say this is what we need over, over 10 years or whatever. We have uh, problems that are both the investment stuff I talked about, but you know, Social Security. I mean, in 10 years or so, 15 years, our Social Security uh, 
program will only be able to pay 50, uh, about 78% of benefits. So we've got to close the social security gap. I believe that has to be dealt with. I wouldn't do it under the income tax system. I'd do it under the payroll tax system, just simply raise the payroll tax by one percentage point. So we've got that long range problem. Um, but we have this major underinvestment problem in the country. I think that $10 trillion is a pretty fair number. We could raise $10 trillion over 10 years, and I believe we can do it through taxing the wealthy corporations. And we, we have a long uh, report on that. That's, a, that's enough to give us, put, advance us in a very significant way. It can't finance something like a Green New Deal, and it can't finance something like a Medicare for All program. Uh, but it can put enough money into infrastructure, housing, healthcare, education, et cetera, to advance us far beyond where we are right now. To do, deal with some of the larger questions, how do we get to universal healthcare in America? Uh, you know, how do we deal with the enormous costs that we're facing with respect to the uh, climate change? Uh, we have no idea how big those are going to be. Uh, those are you know, at a different magnitude uh, and requires a different set of thinking. Obviously, we have to go down lower in the, ta in the scale of who gets taxed for that sort of stuff and, and possibly other alternatives. But that's all sort of, I'm, I'm good with 10 years <laughs> if I get 10 trillion. Bill, did you want to add to that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, as we were talking here, I am kind of put myself, I suddenly got back into tax mode. And a strategy, you know, in 86, what we did was we lowered taxes for essentially retail, right? Anybody that was paying higher than 28% in tax. And we increased taxes on those people who were losing loopholes, which were primarily mining and industry and that kind of thing. <clears throat> so that you split the opposition. Now, what is the opposition to uh, higher taxation? Uh, well, it's uh, the people who pay the tax. So how do you split the people who pay the tax? And that is you do the same thing for uh, people, you know, with assets of 20 million as you did with people who were in retail. In other words, if you had a system where you taxed wealth above $50 million, you could actually provide less tax to people with less than $50 million. And you could, you could make it less than whatever, 20 or 10. And, and uh, you, know, you have to think, I think, always of these trade-offs. What do you get and what do you give? And how can you hold a coalition together? Um, now, given the reconciliation process and the history that McConnell followed, I know we can ram something through, but remember we, we didn't ram it through. We had bipartisan support, 97 to three out of the Senate back in 1986. Four years later, it was eroded. So, you know, tax policy is a little bit like, uh, you know, building castles of sand next to the ocean. It's going to come and wash it away sooner or later. 